Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome at the Optical Networks Testbed and Deployment session at the uh, Terena Networking Conference 2006. Building networks uh, on owned or leased dark fibers has become increasingly popular among the entrants in the last years. In this session, we are going to hear about experiences and lessons learned during the rollout of major large-scale research networks in Europe and the US. Dark fiber-based networks um, also allow for setup of test beds where engineers can develop and test tomorrow's hardware, protocols, and communication concepts. We are going to have three presentations um, in our session today. The first one um, will be given by uh, Dr. Peter Kaufman from DFN. Then we'll have uh, Marianne Garcia Vidondo from uh, Dante. And at the end of the session, there will be uh, a trio from Internet 2. <coughs> right. Uh, so. And, and by the way, I, I should probably introduce myself as well. I'm Katalin Meiroshu. I'm a project development officer with Terena, and I'm the um, uh, PDO supporting the task force engine in, in uh, Terena. <laughs> Thank you, Case. <laughs> right. So our first speaker uh, is here, Dr. Peter Kaufman, is a technical manager in the branch office of DFM Verein. Uh, he has been responsible for the planning and, uh, of advanced projects within the FM. He is currently the project leader for the Viola testbed, and he received a PhD in uh, theoretical nuclear physics from the Free University of Berlin in 1980, and he's doing networks today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Catania. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, afternoon session. Um, in my short uh, overview, I will present you the results of the Viola testbed uh, that we have examined during the last, let's say, 12 to 20 months. The Viola testbed uh, is organized as a consortium of more than 10 members. Participating organizations are universities, research labs, and some industrial companies. The project is uh, going on for three years. We started nearly two years ago. That means we have another good year in front of us. We are supported with about uh, 11 million euro uh, from the German Ministry of Science. And uh, the additional contributions of the participants, especially from the industrial partners, uh, cover again 9 million euro, so the project has something like 20 million euro. The Viola testbed is an integrated testbed. Uh, the, main, uh, the main part uh, is dealing with the network services, uh, with the network technology, something is with middleware and with user applications. Within the uh, network environment, we have uh, three areas. Uh, which we have examined and tested. One area covers uh, the MPLS base, layer two, layer three, private network environments, especially dealing with virtual uh, uh, line services, uh, VPLS and uh, HVPLS, hierarchical VPLS. Then we examined uh, the different features of the next uh, generation SDH which is especially interesting to uh, transport uh, Ethernet, let's say, very efficient uh, over SDH networks. And finally, and certainly the, let's say, most, probably the most important part of our network activities covers uh, the examination of the signaling mechanism, especially oriented to the OIF-defined uh, uh, interfaces. Let's see. Singing interface. In the middleware, we implemented uh, some middleware environment based on the Unicode. We include uh, the PC clusters. 
and we implemented uh, some new middleware tools, some environments, espe especially uh, important are here the meta scheduling, which uh, includes or integrates uh, the different local scheduler uh, uh, related to the loca local uh, supercomputer or PC cluster environment and the implementation of the network reservation system. The uh, goal of the network uh, work, network related work within Viola uh, finally sh shall uh, give experience input uh, to the question which kinds of hybrid networks we will need for the future, what is the relation between the still overwhelming needed best effort IT probably and uh, the line structures we will implement in the future networks, line structures which might use, uh, let's say, hard uh, circuits like Lambda or SDH circuits or what I call soft circuits based on MPLS environments and so on. So uh, we want to get experience about uh, these different environments. We want to contribute to the ongoing development of it. We want to uh, get known with the technical platform and also with operational aspects. And uh, I can already here say that the operational aspects of the uh, upcoming technical network environment uh, are very difficult, let's say. So this is a topology of Viola. The Viola testbed is mainly located in North Rhine-Westphalia, where we have a triangle of uh, uh, participating institutions in the research center of Mülich, in the University of Bonn, and in the Braunhofer Gesellschaft in St. Augustine. Uh, we have some locally related research institutions uh, in that area, and we have a, um, a long distance uh, connectivity to Bavaria, to Nuremberg, and to the University of Erlangen. Here you see that it's certainly very hard to read uh, at the end, but you can have a look uh, after the session maybe at Poli uh, itself. Here you see uh, the, uh, the equipment which we have uh, located within the uh, Viola environment. Uh, the three circles represent uh, the triangle of the institutions uh, Mülich, uh, Berlinghof, uh, St. Augustine, and uh, University of Bonn. In each of these circles, we have placed uh, equip equipment covering SDH uh, uh, equipment from Alcatel, SDH equipment from from Siemens, uh, some routers from Alcatel, and some Ethernet switches from Riverstone. So we have a variety of, uh, of, of, of network elements uh, which w with which we may form different, uh, uh, different domains uh, within the SDH area on one hand and within the, let's say, uh, MPLS environment uh, on the other hand. And of such different domains, we, we are able to, uh, to configure varying uh, possibilities of interaction of, of domain configuration and so on. The users, uh, all the users are interconnected via giga Ethernet interfaces. Uh, this is uh, varying from up to two times giga Ethernet, up to 20 times giga Ethernet, uh, depending on the needs of the participating users. So coming now, after a short overview of what Viola is representing, coming now to, to uh, the sketch of the results. Within the uh, layer two environment, uh, we, we have tested, as I mentioned already, uh, virtual least line services, VPLS, and uh, hierarchical VPLS services. Um, our results uh, show that uh, the basic uh, 
features of uh, this uh, BPLL, BPLS environment is working well. Uh, the interworking uh, between the different equipment is okay. Uh, some quality of service features we have tested, uh, they are working well. It's changing. Okay. Um, we found finally problems uh, with H, VPLS, that means with the implementation of hierarchical uh, VPLS environments. Here you see a logical topology of our VPLS or HVPLS environment. Here you see two, two different islands of VPLS which are connected via two spokes uh, forming an HVPLS environment and here we have seen that uh, especially problems of redundancy, load balancing between such two uh, connections between uh, VPLS environments uh, are still not solved. That means uh, the, uh, the equipment from Alcatel on the one hand and from Riverstone on the other hand uh, are working in the usual VPLS but uh, with a hierarchical environment, uh, load balancing uh, features and so on is, is not working well. In the other area with next generation uh, SDH uh, networks, uh, we tested the major features of the GP, GFP virtual concatenation and ALCAS environment. And again, uh, we, we have seen that uh, within that environment, the interoperability for the basic functionality is working well. So GFP and uh, virtual concatenation uh, between the participating uh, equipment is working well. Uh, we have finally found that the LCAS is not uh, properly interpreted uh, in the same way uh, on all uh, equi equipment uh, we, we have dealt with. Uh, but apart uh, from, from some missing interoperability prop, uh, aspects, we have also found uh, that uh, the, let's say, uh, the dealing with the environment, the configuration, the management of the equipment is very hard still. Uh, it is very, uh, you need a lot of time finally to get the things together, the configuration together, and that uh, relates to the what I mentioned at the beginning, that the operational experiences, uh, even if the interworking is okay, are not, not yet very good. And so that is certainly in uh, certain aspects far, far from operational stability. And this is still more true in uh, the last uh, technical environment which we have examined, that means uh, within the signaling environment, uh, within Viola, we have implemented uh, the different uh, interface, signaling interfaces that have been defined by the OEF consortium. That means we have uh, implemented the UNI uh, release uh, version 1, release 2. We have tested uh, extens extensively. Uh, version 2 we are just uh, implementing. We have tested the NN ENNI, the external NNI and the internal NNI interface. This uh, uh, picture shows you the, uh, the, uh, the, the logical uh, environment uh, when we have started the tests of INNI and uh, UNI version 1 release 2, that means we have tested uh, these different uh, interfaces between the Alcatel SDH switch and between the uh, Sycamore switch on one hand and we have also tested uh, the UNI proxy which has been developed by Alcatel and all of that has been uh, tested with success. So the interoperability between all these components worked well it was successful, but as you see here, all that is still on that level 
very hard to to handle with uh, f far away from from what you would need if you implement uh, that uh, equipment that software within an operational environment Here's, here you see again um, our uh, uh, so the list of uh, the interfaces uh, we have and the procedures we have tested uh, well let's say until here this is uh, our result uh, until March of this year, and since March of this year, um, the uh, UNI uh, interface uh, version 2 is available. It is already implemented on two uh, participating network uh, switches, on the Siemens switch and on the Sycamore switch, and Alcatel will uh, provide uh, UN. Uh, uh, UNI uh, version 2 also during the summer so uh, certainly very soon, very soon uh, after this conference uh, and some tests have already been started but uh, this will go on after this conference with uh, a lot of uh, activities. I will not go into the, the detail of this uh, picture shall only uh, point uh, to the problems we have uh, to configure the environment. Uh, so to configure the environment, that the environment is ready to exchange the signaling. So this is uh, uh, two different uh, aspects of work and uh, just to see here uh, one UNI uh, uh, entity to I, I, I ENI entities and another UNI entities and to configure uh, those entities properly you need a lot of uh, uh, management activities. The management is currently uh, realized via outband uh, signaling, uh, uh, via outband management structures and certainly such uh, stuff we uh, in-band auto configuration is a, is a central part of uh, what is still missing, for example, if you want to put uh, such uh, diverse equipment into operation. Uh, the Viola test bed, uh, we have uh, done a lot of uh, tests within the Viola test bed, but uh, uh, in addition we expanded our uh, signaling tests also to the Muppet test bed which is dealing also with the OIF uh, signaling environments and here you see uh, just from the log logical point of view which uh, pieces of an equipment uh, have uh, successfully used uh, the different signaling uh, features which we have tested successful including UNI access, INNI -N -N -I access between various uh, pieces of the equipment. So we have some, some good experience. Uh, we made some good experience with the interaction with the Muppet environment. Uh, I mentioned that uh, since a uh, few times uh, the UNI version 2 is available within the Viola environment on several pieces uh, and this will be, let's say, the near future uh, uh, environment uh, uh, within Viola using Alcatel with ENNI, the Sycamo with ENNI interfaces and the Siemens HIT uh, 77 with an INNI interface and on all these uh, we hopefully will have uh, the UNI uh, on the network side of course available but also on the user side the user side of the UNI will probably again uh, realized uh, from Alcatel via the proxy. This is a similar picture that is still mostly empty, so we should not go into the details for the UNI tests. Uh, coming now to just uh, for a few words uh, to, to uh, the middleware results uh, that we have uh, had uh, within Viola. I mentioned that uh, there had been an implementation of a meta scheduling 
environment and of a network reservation system, Argon. Um, both of them are running since few months successfully. They are related to the user environments and to the network equipment. And let's say the first version is running tomorrow afternoon within the session light management or something like that, uh, there will be a presentation uh, of, uh, uh, of these two uh, work items, the results and the plans uh, 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 to, to, to uh, develop them further on, so tomorrow afternoon. Coming uh, to the outlook of uh, the testbed, we, I mentioned we have still another year in front. Of course, we will uh, go on with our tests. Uh, probably the majority of the tests uh, will cover the signaling area, not as much as in earlier times the new SDH and the BPLS environment. So this is. Uh, uh, particularly, we will include the UNI uh, features, which allow now uh, also to interconnect uh, users uh, not only with a framing via SDH, but also with a framing via uh, Giga Ethernet or 10 Giga Ethernet uh, uh, equipment. We have uh, started two months ago in March of this year just uh, for some testing uh, to, to upgrade some pieces of the environment up to 40 gigabit uh, and so to test uh, some 40 gigabit environments, uh, components within the Viola environments and uh, what will be certainly presented uh, tomorrow in more detail, also the ready uh, uh, tools of the middleware, the meta scheduler and the Argon system will be finalized and made me made be uh, made become will become more operational. Let's say for varying environments. Thank you very much. That was an overview about Viola. Thank you, Peter. Any questions? question regarding the VPLS. Did you do any testing with uh, BGP-based VPLS? Uh, I don't think so. I'm not, uh, I'm, let's say, I assume not, but I'm not really involved in those experiments. If you are interested to know that very much in detail, we could uh, make a contact to the guys who made the tests, but I think no. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Then I have a question. Um, Peter, could you please give more details about the problems that you encounter with LCAS? With what? With LCAS, with the link capacity adjustment scheme tests. <sighs> um, um, I mean, uh, it was it was possible to to configure the LCAS. So uh, if, you, uh, if you are on both of sides of the equipment configured LCAS, you could start the LCAS. But uh, it was not, as I remember, not regularly possible. For example, if you interrupt on one side, the other side didn't work well, and vice versa. So, but uh, Ferdinand Horn is, is over there. He made those tests. Uh, I think he can give you uh, even more details about that. Uh, some short remarks uh, concerning the tests. Uh, the tests work wonderful if you only have tests between the equipment of one uh, provider. So sure. we have no problems <laughs> with uh, testing Alcatel to Alcatel and Atva to Atva. But there were problems when we were testing Alcatel with uh, Atva. And the problem was if you have an LCAS group and you are going to take out some of the members out of this group, uh, then the problem was that 
one side is, did not uh, see that the other side has taken out some members. So uh, currently the vendors are working on this problem and I hope that it will be fixed some time in this year. Thank you very much. Let's thank Peter again. Okay, so the next speaker is Marianne Garcia Vidondo. Um, she has been working for Dante uh, as an operation manager since April 2000 after finishing her uh, MSc in telecommunications engineering in the Public University of Navarra. And as a, an operation manager, she provides technical assistance in different projects that Dante coordinate, such as Alice, and uh, she also leads the team whose current main task involves the implementation and management of the next generation network Jean2. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, the presentation I'm going to do today um, will give you some inputs about our experiences building a hybrid pan-European network over dark fiber. Contents of my presentation will start, or will start speaking about researchers and researchers' requirements in terms of communication. For those that don't know about Dante, the company I'm working for, I will briefly describe what we do at Dante, and I will pass to speak about the Anchu, the Anchu infrastructure, the end two uh, components, the dark fiber, the DWDM, SDH equipment. And I will finish with uh, the services that we provide to the research community and uh, some conclusions. And speaking about researchers and data transfers, I think it's fair to say that during the last few years there have been changes in the requirements coming from the research community in terms of communication and data transfers. We have gone from having thousands of end users behind universities, students, sending a small amount of traffic and using applications that were not very sensitive to network performance like emails or FTP transfers. We have gone from having this type of users to have a new bank of users. Um, users um, can be counted by hundreds, but um, send um, high uh, traffic flows, more than one qubit per second, for example, between well-defined nodes, and using applications that are very sensitive to the network performance. We all have heard about the SEND LSC, about registronomers, about um, data, the distributed European supercomputer application. So I would like you to keep in mind these requirements because it's important for understanding the following slide, slides of my presentation. So what is Dante? Dante is a company that is located in Cambridge. It was founded in 1993 by the European National Research Network. And Dante's role has always been to plan, implement, and manage a succession of pan-European networks. Here is when we find the ANTU. The ANTU is the most recent successor of seven generations of pan-European networks. And the ANTU is providing connectivity to the European National Research Network. The ANTU predecessor, that was the ANT, provided IP services over least IPS circuits. However, 
DIAN2 will provide um, WDM, SDH, and IP services over the dark fiber. Trying to address all these requirements that I was talking about in my previous slide. So this is the DIAN2 map. I'm not sure if it's very clear from the end of the room. Um, DIAN2 is connecting 32 national research and networks. Um, you can see the scope of the network. This thick uh, yellow line represents the routes that are using uh, dark fiber. As you can see, all the network is not using dark fiber. We still have lit SDH circuits because fi dark fiber is not reaching everywhere. The main squares represent the main point of presence. And you can see that we are going from Denmark all to the south to Spain and uh, reaching Ireland, London, and even the East countries, Hungary, Slovakia. So that gives you an idea what is the scope of this network. So what has happened during the last few months is that we have been migrated from the old DIAN network, as I said, providing only IP services over SDH circuits to the new DIAN2 network, a network that uses dark fiber, WDM equipment, and SDH equipment to provide new services to the research community. So what, has, uh, what are the main challenges that we have seen during this implementation? The first one was the tender process. We follow a tender process both for connectivity and for equipment. And this process was long, was long and was complex. Mm, the complexity can be explained, first of all, because of the amount of responses we had. Just to give you an example, we had around 900 answers for um, possibilities of dark fiber routes. But it's not only complexity coming from the amount of answers, but as well because we had to keep in mind all the financial aspects of this project we needed to check that the option of using dark fiber was cost effective versus the option of using the traditional SDH circuits. And of course, in order uh, to do so, we have to follow both tenders in parallel and needed to be finished at the same time in order to combine both costs and compare them with the SDH circuits. And in order to compare these costs, we needed to have a projection of the network usage. We needed to know what are going to be the needs of, uh, from the network during the life cycle of the project. So that gives us a complex uh, process. The second challenge we had was um, the implementation of the network itself. First of all, because it's something that we haven't done before, but as well because of the scale of this project. Don't forget that we implemented dark fiber crossing 15 different countries. The third main challenge was to migrate the services. When we had the new DIAN2 infrastructure in place, we needed to move the services from DIAN to DIAN2 infrastructure without disrupting of the service already provided to the end user. For that, we need extra resources in terms of manpower, extra resources in terms of hardware as well as in connectivity. And the last main challenge, of course, is that this is a new technology, a network that needs to be operational, that requires of a net new network operation center and requires monitoring tools that need to be developed. So let's go and bring play through the different Jan 2 components. The first one is dark fiber. I don't think I need to talk much about that. I have already heard during this uh, conference um, the current market situation with the dark fiber. We have heard that um, NRNs already have access to their own dark fiber. We have heard that nowadays it's easier and accessible to have this dark fiber. And to this we have to add the fact that in the last few years, Yeah, 
better? All right. Yes. So yes, I was saying that we have already heard that um, the acce uh, acce current accessibility of dark fiber, and as well as the fact that in the last few years we have had quite a lot of development in optical transmission equipment. So in Jan 2, uh, we end up having 18 dark fiber routes with a total of 12,000 kilometers of fiber running around 15 different European countries. And of course, there are still a list of SDS circuits, as I said, in the number of 26. For the DWDM equipment as well, we have seen that during the last decade, there have been quite improvement, a lot of improvements in this equipment. I just mentioned a few of these characteristics, the um, less requirements for footprint, for energy consumption, the increase of spectral density, the facilities to add new wavelengths. Um, for Jan 2, the equipment that we are using are um, Alcatel 1626 line manager. And the last component I wanted to mention is the TDM switching equipment. The acquisition of this equipment was driven by the requirements, again, coming from the research community. Requirements in terms of needs of point-to-point -point circuits, typically giga Ethernet, inter, um, giga Ethernet interfaces, but up to 10 giga Ethernet capacity. Of course, when we're looking for this type of equipment, we are looking for very specific um, features and characteristics. Guaranteed jitter, prioritized switching, QE mechanism, deterministic connections, and this we can achieve using the next generation of optical cross-connects. These um, next generation optical cross connects are SDH Sonnet cross connects with Ethernet support and with functionalities that we have all heard about, like PCAT or GFP. The equipment that we are using in Jan 2 is the Alcatel 1678 MCC. So, what are the main steps that we have to follow in order to have this network operation? The first was the dark fiber. The dark fiber was delivered, and the dark fiber had to meet the contractual agreements in terms of um, attenuation, chromatic dispersion, optical retolerance, PMD. So once we have the dark fiber delivered, we needed to install the optical equipment. And this, again, this optical equipment had to meet the contractual requirements in terms of hardware availability, so is this hardware functioning correctly? And in terms of the design, can we light up this link using this hardware? Once the equipment was in place, we needed to develop an integrated management system, management system to manage all the optical equipment, the line managers and the 1678 MCCs. And in parallel, we had to build a new network operation center uh, with appropriate tools in order to monitor this new equipment. With all that, we are able to deliver um, new bunch of services, and as, as, as I said before, driven by the requirements of the research community. These new services are typically available to all the national research networks that are in the dark fiber cloud that I saw, I saw in uh, the second slide. These services will allow the establishment of switched point-to-point -point circuits to different locations in Europe. And so we are even, um, we have an initiative, a trial, of provide these Ethernet services and transatlantic links between some European uh, locations and some US locations. So what are the services that we offer to the national research networks? Well, this can be divided between Ethernet services and SDH services. And the Ethernet services can be divided between Giga Ethernet services, where the customers will come to us and will connect either to one Giga Ethernet port or either to a 10 Giga Ethernet port in our switch, and therefore we need to use VLANs. Or we can offer the 10 Giga Ethernet <coughs> services. 
In that case, the user will come to us and will connect to our switch or will connect directly into our WDM equipment. For the RDS services, this can be provided via the TDM switch or again via the WDM equipment. For the SDH switch, the um, ports available are STM16 and STM64. Sub rates can be offered, but they haven't been implemented so far. And thanks to that, NRNs can set up multiple SDH services, configuring cross connections through Jan2. Or these SDH services can be offered directly into our transmission equipment. In that case, the feature that we offer to the NRNs is transparency because they can't um, configure multiple services, SDS services, without notifying the JAN2 operator. So um, we have the network, we are providing the services, what are the challenges that we have ahead? Here I have mentioned just three. The first one I mentioned is the inter-domain provisioning of these services. We are here talking about control planes, bandwidth of demand, GMPLS. But not only the provisioning of these services, but the monitoring of these services. How to do that in an inter-domain environment. The second challenge that I mentioned here is security. What are the risks that we need to keep in mind with new equipment, with new applications running on top of this new equipment. And the last but no less challenge is the 40 gigabit in client interfaces. We all have heard about the PMD issues, chromatic dispersions. In fact, this morning I learned in one of the sessions that um, there was a survey done in Brazil for five hours that were run in the last 10 years and 20% of these fibers, I think, to remember, has a PMD over 0.5 picoseconds per square kilometer. So I think there are a lot of things to, to work on, and the 40 gigabit per second will be a challenge, probably for Jan 3 project. So just to finish with some of the conclusions, um, as we said, many research networks, they already have dark fiber. And this has meant a huge change in the scope of services that can be provided to the end users. Following that trend and following that requirement, Jan2 have developed this network that is based as well in least dark fiber. After nine, 10 months of hard work, I'm happy to say, I'm glad to say that the network is practically implemented. 90% of the network is there, is operational, is being used to provide IP services to the NRN, and um, these point-to-point -point services that I was talking about, they are being implemented at the moment. And that was the, my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marianne. Questions? Okay, then could you say something more about the monitoring that you're uh, thinking of using in this uh, mixed environment uh, where you have uh, IP services and optical services? Yes, um, for the optical services, uh, we are using a proprietary tool provided by Alcatel in which we have an integrated monitoring tools for not only monitoring but management and provisioning for both elements. So it's one tool to uh, manage uh, the line manager and the MCC, the optical equipment and the SDH equipment. We have, aside of that, we used to have our own tools to monitor um, IP services. Basically it was based in traps and something called NAJUS. So the main challenge has been to try to integrate these two in a different level. So to be able to receive for example, for the NOC, it was very important to receive uh, traps from all these services and to be able to raise tickets and to raise alarms. 
So this is something that we are working on. There is a specific module in the Alcatel equipment as well, that is the IOO module, that allows to send traps to the NOC. So uh, the NOC is uh, currently receiving traps for both the line manager and the SDH and the IP equipment. And these are filtered out, and then at the end you have an alarm, independently of where it is coming from. So it has been uh, hard work to get to that point, but I'm glad to say that more or less the, this, these um, tools are now fully integrated in our network operation center. Other questions? Do you have any statistics how these new services are already used? For example, are more users using one gigabit services or more users using 10 gigabit services? Um, well, I don't have the statistics at the moment. Um, what I can say is that, well, let's leave aside the IP services because the IP services were already provided and we have just replicated this in this new network. For end-to-end -end services, um, now, for example, just, just to give you an example, we are working with CERN, LHC, and what they are requesting to us are directly wavelengths, SDN64 wavelengths or 10 giga Ethernet wavelengths. We all know about CERN and this amount of flow that they are planning to send in 2007, so that's, that's one of the main things now, and they are requesting wavelengths. However, we have as well, we have offered the opportunity to the NRNs to connect via 10 giga Ethernet interface in our MCC in order for them to be able to have different flows to different locations. And uh, we, are having, we have had requests, so we are implementing them, but however, it's a bit early for me to tell you how much of this will be utilized in the next few months. I think we are still in the deployment phase. Thank you. One question in the back. The main functionality you provide by your Ethernet over SDH is surely also for sub gigabit and sub 10 gigabit Ethernet uh, connections and services. Are these services requ requested until now from your customers? You mean lower capacitors than giga Ethernet interfaces? Yeah, if I have an well, interface of one gigabit Ethernet, nobody tells me that I have to use it. Uh, so sub rates are very obvious. Now, for instance, this increase in efficiency you can use in your Geon2 not network. Well, I mean, for I would say that for capacities that are under giga Ethernet interface, this IP network has enough capacity to absorb them. I mean, the IP network has uh, links of 10 gigabit per second. So for a small flows, there is no such a need to have any specific hardware all around the network to be deployed extra hardware to support these small um, capacities. Um, we haven't received any requests so far. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. So for the 10 giga Ethernet, um, the physical port in the MCC, that is a TDM switch, will allow NRNs to have flows at one, two, or three gigabit per second. The same will happen with the STM64. We offer 64 BC4s, and the NRN can be using 16 of them to provide a connection to site B, another 16 to provide a connection to site C. Yeah. Further questions? Then I, I have a question. Uh, since you mentioned end-to-end -end performance, could you please give more details? What is being done in, in Jean to, to uh, help users that experience performance on the network, on, on their end-to-end -end, uh, data transfers or, or applications? Okay. Well, definitely that's one of the challenges that I brought at the beginning, to provide an end-to-end. -end. When I mean end-to-end -end as a challenge, means crossing different domains. So there are definitely um, different uh, research or joint research activities together with the NRN working in that topic. Um, just to give you an example, we are working at the moment in the weather map that will give um, the end user um, the view of the 
situation of the connectivity of the lambdas within Jan 2. And then this needs to be expanded to different domains. And that's where the complexity began. So I think we are still at the beginning of this work. And well, it's a still development work. OK, thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> the next presentation will be delivered by a team from Internet2. Uh, we have Steve Cotter, Anna Preston, and Christian Todorov. Uh, and I'll leave Anna to introduce everybody. Oh, sure. That's, that's perfect. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Kathleen mentioned, I'm Anna Preston. I'm program manager for network services within Internet2. Internet and we're delighted to be here. Um, personally, I've been trying to make the Trena meetings for now three times in a row, so I'm very happy that I finally was able to make my very first one. Uh, uh, let's see, here we go. Um, as uh, Kathleen mentioned, we're going to kind of change our program a little bit because we're actually, I'm going to be team tagging with my colleagues who are also here from Internet2. And I'm going to let them uh, introduce themselves and what their titles are when they actually pick it up from me. Can everybody hear me? OK. OK. And I noticed that we're, there were some people standing there. There's some space here in the front, by the way. Some people want to move this way. There's a lot of empty chairs here. But um, anyway, we'll go ahead and get started. So um, again, we're going to be talking a little bit about what's going on in the United States have to apologize a little bit because we're going to make a little bit, you know, if you read the abstract, um, we're going to take the liberty of changing a little bit uh, what we're going to present from what you see in that abstract. As we were thinking of ways of uh, sort of best present what we wanted to talk about, um, we discovered that one of the things we, we, we we're going to highlight as a project is Fabrico, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. But uh, Fabrico is really part of a larger story of the many things that are happening in the United States. So uh, I hope uh, we apologize for making this change and also for uh, throwing in a team effort here. Uh, but we thought uh, it'd be uh, the right thing to do. So anyway, hope you can bear with us on that. This is the outline of what we're going to cover. So I'm just going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, you know, sort of the community requirements and sort of lay forth the context for some of the projects that uh, we're going to be uh, covering, including Fabrico, the Manhattan Landing International Exchange Point, the Hopi Project, um, and National Lambda Rail. And then we're going to talk a little bit about lessons learned, uh, sort of to indicate where our thinking is going. So um, I think by now, uh, pretty much everybody knows Internet2 is the NREN of the United States. Our national infrastructure is called Abilene, the Abilene Network. And that's basically the national scale uh, network that Internet2 manages and operates. In early 2005, uh, what we refer to as the Abilene TAC, or the Technical Advisory Committee, this is a group of networking experts that guides uh, Internet, too, in terms of its uh, sort of thinking towards networking um, infrastructure developments, if you will, but also gathers input from the community. This group was tasked with producing a report that could help Internet, too, uh, sort of think about, um, you know, sort of where we needed to go in the next five to seven years. And uh, this group was tasked with produ producing a report and essentially this report uh, lay forward some of the points that you see here, um, essentially to, you know, and I guess I'll just go through some of these to make sure that we will continue to have a high quality uh, production level IP as a common bearer service, while still providing uh, definitely uh, support for network measurement and monitoring, uh, support for experimentation and early adoption of network services, but also to be able to add uh, a whole range of other services, the ability to uh, provision over late networks, over the infrastructure, support traffic engineering and prioritization, uh, offer commodity routing to, and targeted IP and optical peerings. Um, unlike um, 
previous generations, if you will, our network security um, as, a, as an element was pretty much an instrumental thing that this group captured that, uh, as an area that had to be integrated into the network design from the very outset. Um, a very similar group, what we call Group A, and essentially uh, this was a very similar group in terms of networking experts uh, from Internet2, but also from uh, National Lambda Rail and from um, the private sector was also uh, formed and delivered a report. This report was delivered in mid-2005 to also sort of help shape um, sort of the, the vision, if you will, for advanced networking uh, for the five next five to seven years at that point. And what this group concluded was um, essentially, and by the way, the URLs for these reports and for all the projects that we're going to mention are listed at the bottom. It's a little bit hard to see it there, but if you pull up the slides, you can see it, and then you can actually read the full report there. But in summary, what this um, Group A report sort of put forth was um, how the community in the research and higher education community in the United States uh, really needing a far richer, if you will, networking capabilities environment in a way, and the graph here hopefully illustrates this, also proposing a sort of multi-dimensional space where several things uh, could be considered. For example, providing capabilities at every network layer, from layer zero, uh, for example, through dark fiber, all the way through layer three, but essentially with every component in between. So layer zero, layer one, layer two, layer three, or in terms of services uh, from dark fiber to um, uh, waves, GIGI, MPLS, Sonnet, all the way to IP v4 and v6, so forth. Uh, we're also on another, if you will, access here of this uh, multi-dimensional space. It would be also the ability to provide, uh, you know, services either in the short term or to the long term, variable uh, time frames here too. And um, also the ability to have these, uh, if you will, from experimental to the production um, and even experimental, uh, even for example at the optical layer, to just steady, robust production services as well. Um, other things that, uh, and again I invite you to read the full report, where um, again, you know, observations that, you know, the access of any future infrastructure also needed to include all the access to all the other U.S., uh, you know, high performance uh, networking infrastructures, including, you know, the, uh, the networking infrastructures of uh, Department of Energy, uh, ESNet, Department of Defense, uh, National Lambda Rail, Ultra Science Net, et cetera, the multiple um, infrastructures emerging. So um, that said, um, what we're going to cover now is a set of projects that within Internet2, um, you know, as we sort of, now with the context of these uh, reports and sort of observations, um, you know, we sort of, uh, there, there's these projects where sort of to define where we're going, these, the, some of these projects sort of were set up in a way to kind of charter also the territory and see where we needed to go as well. I'm going to talk about just one of them and then pass it on to my colleagues. Um, FiberCo, uh, which is actually stands for the National, Re National, Fi National Research and Education Fiber Company. It's a project that Internet2 set up back in 2003 with the primary goal of supporting optical networking efforts in the U.S. higher education community. And essentially with that main goal of supporting optical initiatives, um, we envision providing a vehicle and a means for the community being able to acquire dark fiber. And um, that said, um, you know, we're, uh, this project is, has been set up and was set up as a, essentially a project to, uh, that, that would be able to assign or be, have the ability to hold on to dark fiber. Um, and by aggregating demand, we were able to then um, have that fiber available at very uh, deeply discounted rates, way under market pricing um, from their own. So in a way, this was a mechanism and a vehicle that became in the United States a, a market maker because not only we were able to uh, assign the fiber, you know, through the, sort of what we had been um, 
aggregating, but also others came to the table in other, uh, um, in, in other carriers, if you will, and uh, sort of became a, a market maker. So um, as of March of this year, uh, through this uh, project, we were able to assign more than 13,000 miles of fiber to entities in the United States and actually also in Canada. So, um, and, and, that, and that's it. So this has helped us kind of see, you know, sort of a lot of acquisition in terms of dark fiber assets in the U.S. community. As a natural next step, um, and obviously we're very aware of the challenges in sort of, you know, from lighting to operating and managing optical networking, we saw early on that there was a need for those universities or regionals, if you will, that had acquired dark fiber to also have uh, access, if you will, uh, to services and, um, and things that previously were only available to service providers. So in partnership with industry, we started thinking about uh, also providing a means that then uh, these entities could essentially uh, have carrier class services, if you will, uh, that could be available to them also at discounted prices um, or significantly lower than market pricing. So, and these services can entail a full range of services and turnkey solutions. Anything that will go from design, this, it's okay, keep on talking, okay. Design to, uh, I feel like a singer. That's, <laughs> but you don't want me to be singing, that's for sure. And uh, from design to implementation to uh, all the operational um, aspects, uh, again, at discounted rates. And that said, uh, this has been an area that many of our members are very interested in because it frees up resources uh, in terms, and as you guys know, managing and operating optical infrastructures can be very expensive. So. Uh, in a way, this has allows our members to also think, and those that are buying these services, on how they can do this more cost efficiently, and um, and again, you know, look at ways that they can do this now at, at a carrier class level. So this is a little bit about this project, which will tie in a little bit more to some other projects. And now I'm going to introduce Christian Todorov. Well, you certainly don't want me singing, so. Uh, my name is Christian Todorov. Uh, I'm with uh, Internet2. I'm a network engineer. Uh, I have operational uh, responsibility for the Manland node. Uh, <clears throat> Manland, excuse me, uh, is a open international exchange point that uh, uh, Internet2 runs. And there are several features um, that uh, are very interesting about Manland. Uh, one is the fact that it operates both on, at layer one and layer two. Uh, there's uh, a uh, bilateral peering uh, agreement uh, mechanism so that any two entities that mutually agree to uh, peer with each other, it's basically made so. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things uh, that, that we can do uh, on the layer one side is we can bring in uh, an OC192, for example, and uh, allow that to be broken down into its uh, subrate, uh, into uh, subrate channels, and then uh, passed on to a variety of, of different peers at the at the optical level. Uh, one of the things that we would like to do, um, we do not yet have the capability to do, is to allow for uh, user control, uh, and that's simply a a limitation in the in the current software that we have. Uh, but the goal here is to really move towards a network that allows for end users, and we can, you know, argue and discuss how, you know, who is actually an end user, uh, but allow the users of the network to essentially dictate how their traffic gets passed through the network. So, uh, like I said, that is a, uh, a goal of, uh, of ours, and it's just a matter of, being able to uh, to implement that. Um, one of the other uh, one of the other things is that you know it, it was uh, mentioned here that you know peering at layer three was is a fairly well understood activity, and so we really wanted to take 
uh, that notion and try to force it down the stack. Uh, so that's, I think we've been fairly successful there. Right now, just to let you know, uh, in the optical realm, uh, even though we don't, we can't technically allow for uh, user control because this is a production facility uh, and it's our job really to maintain the stability of the node. Uh, that's our primary concern. Uh, so <clears throat> that said, uh, again, because of, of the bi bilateral uh, peering uh, agreement and, and nature of, of the way that the, the node operates, uh, any two, again, can make a request uh, to RNOC and, <clears throat> excuse me, and then RNOC will simply implement. So it's, it's not perfect, but it's, it's what we have uh, today. And so in, when I was speaking of, of user control, that really goes into uh, one of the uh, main ideas that surrounds Hopi, which is the uh, hybrid uh, optical and packet infrastructure. And essentially what the, the goal of Hopi uh, is to uh, take packet switch networks and combine them, uh, com combine the capabilities of packet switch networks where appropriate with circuit switch networks. And so ultimately, uh, it would be that an application uh, would potentially make a call to the network and the network basically is completely invisible to the user. If the application would require dedicated bandwidth, then the network would be able to provide that. Uh, or if they were simply doing email or some other low uh, demand application, it would go over the traditional packet switch network. Um, so currently what we have is uh, we have uh, nodes set up across the country <coughs> on the NLR footprint. And so what it looks like, this is, this is basically uh, what a node uh, consists of. So you have uh, <clears throat> indicated in here, you have the multiple waves uh, that come into the NLR transport equipment. Uh, the Hopi wave uh, is broken out. It feeds into an optical cross connect uh, at, at this point. And uh, from there, it can either be passed on directly, uh, going from east to west, or uh, brought down uh, to a direct connector, uh, just depends on the situation. Uh, or it can be redirected into the Ethernet switch uh, where you would be able to uh, essentially, you know, statistically mox uh, giggy connections that are, you know, directly connected into that Ethernet switch. Uh, it also allows for, as you can see on the, on the side here, uh, there's three uh, servers, uh, and there's a, a control plane server, a measurement server, and a support server. Uh, the control plane server is actually uh, where a lot of the interesting work's going on. Right now, we are uh, working with uh, uh, actually a number of folks, but one of the, one of the uh, uh, main projects that stands out is the Dragon Project with uh, Jerry Sobieski. And uh, part of that uh, GMPLS signaling, uh, that all, that is all set up on the uh, uh, control plane uh, PC. The measurement PC has a 10 gig interface, uh, and so you know we're able to do <clears throat> not quite 10 gig because of some hardware limitations within the PC itself. However, we can do uh, you know somewhere in the neighborhood of five gigabits or so. So certainly better than than a one gig rate. And uh, the other important thing, uh, and this really is the, is the hybrid portion of this, uh, you'll notice that uh, in the Abilene cloud here, uh, it comes up through uh, a, a T640. And so what, what actually uh, can happen is that uh, a, a researcher at a given university can use the Layer 3 network, uh, but essentially it would be an MPLS tunnel that would go uh, from there uh, either their home institution or their uh, regional provider uh, through uh, the uh, uh, Abilene network to the router, and then it would get plugged into the uh, into the uh, 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 layer one network. 
So this is what uh, Hopi actually looks like. Um, one <coughs> minor uh, point. Uh, you'll notice, uh, well, first let me say, uh, in the black, uh, it is uh, existing, uh, existing nodes uh, and existing connections. The connection between New York and Washington should also be black. Uh, that, is, uh, that is complete. Um, and as you can see, uh, the blue dots represent the Hopi nodes. The red dots rep represent the uh, Abilene Layer 3 nodes. And uh, you'll, you'll notice that it basically runs from Los Angeles uh, over to Washington. And that essentially followed the, uh, the first build out uh, the first phase of the build out of the NLR uh, footprint. Um, the, the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the uh, footprint has been completed. Uh, however, uh, we do not yet have a node, uh, nor do I believe that we've actually requested that the southern route uh, get connected. That's just a uh, matter of time. But uh, getting the, the node in Houston, which is a, uh, a very key uh, area for us, uh, is there's actually some uh, difficulty uh, in trying to get that dark fiber connected in the metro, in the metro area. Um, so, again, uh, the the whole notion here is really to try to uh, examine how we can move from uh, and integrate uh, the uh, traditional IP service with new optical services. And with that, I am going to. Uh, I think I've covered most of this. Oh, one of the one of the uh, big things that we've actually done, uh, it, just recently, in fact, uh, we've we've got the connection uh, up from uh, through Manland. So so the, uh, all of these things really kind of tie together. So the Hopi node in New York actually has a connection into the Manlan exchange point. And we've just brought up uh, a 10 gigabit service from New York to London uh, to Giant for point-to-point uh, -point experimentation. Uh, so that's, that's basically uh, Hopi and how it relates uh, to Manlan. And I'm going to uh, pass the microphone to uh, Steve Cotter. He's the uh, Director of Network Services uh, at Internet2. And thank you. Thanks, Christian. Uh, as you said, I'm Steve Cotter, Director of Network Services at Internet2. And I've got responsibility for the Manland, uh, overall responsibility, uh, FiberCo, and the Abilene Network that uh, Internet2 has. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, National Lambda Rail. It's not a project of Internet 2, but we are uh, the largest single investor in National Lambda Rail. And we use uh, in a wave across the entire footprint for the Hobie project, as Christian uh, talked about. Um, being involved in this project uh, yeah, helped us uh, to further understand what we needed to do with a next generation network that, uh, you know, is working towards the objectives of combining the, the hybrid uh, optical and packet infrastructure pieces. So uh, some of the things that we learned through the National Land Rail project is, um, one, the importance of acquiring the, a strategic asset like dark fiber for a 20-year period, and, and how that gave us leverage with the carriers. Um, if you own the dark fiber, you can do what you want with it. And uh, that, was, that was very important in the current environment uh, telecom in the U.S. Uh, we also found that having a national project like National Land Rail provided the impetus and motivation for uh, mobilizing a lot of the RON development. These regional optical networks, you need them built out in a country the size of the U.S. Uh, to get to the researchers. Uh, the backbone can be quite a distance away from uh, these universities and somehow you've got to get uh, onto the campuses. And having a national uh, project like National Land Rail um, kind of generated a lot of excitement, uh, got a lot of state governments involved in the funding uh, because they saw it as an economic development opportunity. Um, and this is very important considering the fact that uh, National Land Rail didn't get any funding from the federal uh, government space. Uh, 
again, uh, reemphasize the need to uh, reach out to the, the network research and computational science communities. And uh, the way we saw it is that National Land Rail was the beginning of the implementation of the Group A vision. Um, their implementation of, of the optical technologies provided uh, static lambdas and a gig e VLAN uh, national uh, structure, which was the, the beginning of what we eventually like to uh, roll out with our next generation network. Uh, it also uh, gave us a very good insight into the challenges of managing a national scale uh, infrastructure. Uh, it's, it's very difficult, it's very challenging. Um, you know, if, if there's a reason why the carriers have thousands of employees and are highly capitalized because it takes a lot of time and money to, to run these networks as a carrier class service. And uh, being involved in, in National Land Rail gave us some very good insight that the community didn't normally get. So some of the lessons uh, that we learned from this were uh, looking to incorporate into uh, where we go forward. Um, you know, we, we understand that it's very important to control the infrastructure. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later and, and what we mean by control. Um, our control, you know, is, is a little bit different than, than some others, uh, their definition of it. Uh, we at Internet2 felt that it's important to leverage a carrier partnership. If we can find a carrier that's willing to work with us, um, then that's a way to go because that allows us to uh, focus on technical innovation and supporting the researchers rather than spending all of our time and resources in managing the day-to-day -day operations of, um, the, you know, the, if you're a, a railroad, you don't want to spend all your time maintaining the tracks. You want to run the trains, and that's what we wanted to do. Uh, also, we wanted to capitalize on the latest technological advancements, uh, some of the really recent um, uh, uh, equipment that's uh, come out uh, allow for some decreased costs and expanded capabilities, and we want to take advantage of that. Um, and the Internet 2 community is, is actually quite large. We've got 46,000 K through 12 institutions connected to uh, Internet 2. So we had to make sure that we created a, a that the next generation network takes care of all of our members and benefits the entire community, not just. Uh, universities and researchers, but also the K through 12 and, and the regionals and, and uh, our international partners. So talking about control of the infrastructure, um, you know, in working with a carrier in a, in a partnership type environment, we, we still felt that having a dedicated system was essential. Uh, you know, we, we feel that having a network on a separate fiber pair uh, using the latest optical and, and switching technologies is the best way to go. That, that being on a shared system with other carrier customers um, makes it too difficult to do what we want to do with the infrastructure if they have to worry about um, you know, what we do and how that impacts their other customers. So we wanted uh, a dedicated system. Uh, but we also wanted to control the key aspects of the optical uh, system. And, and that is something that is very much sticking outside the box for the traditional telecom carrier. Um, but we wanted to be able to provision these wavelengths, you know, when and, and for how long that, that we needed. Um, we didn't want to wait 12 weeks from the time we placed it in order for, for the optical system to be up. Um, we wanted to have this network be a natural extension of, of the work that we're doing with Hopi. And over the the five to seven year time frame, we want to be able to develop new services that we haven't even envisioned yet today. Uh, and most importantly, you know, working with a carrier, we wanted to have um, a non-restrictive acceptable use policy. We didn't want the carrier telling us what sort of traffic we could or could not put on this infrastructure. We wanted to be able to have total control of it. So. I've talked about the carrier partnership and, and what that means. Um, 
obviously there are advantages and disadvantages of, of any partnership, but what we wanted to get out of this was we wanted to leverage experience and operational capabilities of the carrier. Uh, we wanted to take advantage of the economies of scale. Uh, building out a, uh, an optical infrastructure is, is, a, is a, an effort that requires a lot of um, capital expense, a lot of operational expense, and you know, a higher ed is, is um, in the bigger realm, a, a small community and with a small number of users, and that model doesn't fit very well with a highly capitalized um, industry. So we wanted to kind of take advantage of the economies of scale. So if we could um, look at building a future network where uh, the carrier uses the same optical infrastructure and we can take advantage of uh, common sparing pools, uh, technicians that are trained on the same equipment, reducing uh, training costs, um, those sorts of economies of scale. That's what we wanted to kind of take advantage of. And also working with a carrier allows you, particularly in a, an environment like the U.S., um, they have far more capabilities to reach beyond the backbone. And, you know, it would be very difficult for us to work and find a way to get to each of the 230 universities that are connected to Abilene today without the help of a carrier. So we, we needed that partnership. We also feel that it's very important to keep industry engaged for the, for, um, you know, the, the, the ability to continue to evolve uh, the networking capabilities. Uh, keeping them engaged uh, allows them to continue to give us access to dark fiber, co-location, which is important if, if researchers want to co-locate equipment near our nodes for research purposes. Uh, we want to be able to do that. And what we had to do is convince these carriers that um, we were not a competitor and, and not there to steal business from them, but can act as, a, as an, an aggregator of the communities and, and bring the community to them if, they, if the universities wanted to uh, purchase production services along with uh, getting their research needs met. So in this, uh, as we learned about what we wanted to do with this new network and, and next generation, uh, you know, I mentioned we wanted to take advantage of the technical uh, capabilities of these new uh, generation of Tronix vendors. And we, we have a need for uh, uh, many more waves than uh, you know, some of the, the earlier generation capabilities. We want to be able to have the, the chance to expand the capacity beyond 80 waves, um, have uh, the capability to uh, do sub-Lambda uh, circuits. You know, not everyone's going to want to be connected at 10 gig. They want 1 gig or, or other sizes. We can do that through, um, through uh, the digital means. We want to have end-to-end -end capabilities with GMPLS. And um, again, as, as uh, everyone's mentioned about the needs to uh, have performance monitoring, uh, we want to have that capability uh, with this new network as well but also provide multiple protection and restoration uh, modes uh, to make sure that we have a production class uh, network. Uh, it was, it's important to us to have an aggressive roadmap. Uh, 40 gigs has been talked a lot. Uh, you know, that capability exists today. It's not economically feasible yet. Um, but there's also a lot of work being done right now on 100 gig interfaces and uh, which one we go to. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll let the community decide when the time comes, but we want to be able to at least have that uh, available to us. And uh, lastly, one of the reasons why we, we felt that uh, carrier partnership uh, was important versus uh, partnering with a single vendor is that uh, it gives us the future flexibility. Uh, we're not tied into a specific religion. If, if something uh, groundbreaking or disruptive comes out, then we would work with the carrier to roll that uh, technology or service out. 
So in um, October of 2007, the, the current Abilene contract with uh, our current carrier Quest uh, ends. And at that time, uh, Internet2 will have to find um, a, a new network and have it deployed and begin the transition of our members onto this new network. And we want to be able to roll out uh, more than just the IP bear service that, that we have uh, today. So uh, we're looking to roll out these dynamic services with the ability to provision these in, um, in seconds to minutes for durations of hours to months uh, through both immediate reservation and advanced reservation service and continue to expand the, uh, the model for future collaboration with the industry so that any other uh, vendors that want to be able to offer Hopi-like services across the infrastructure would be willing to partner with us. Um, in addition to, to offering uh, services just to re researchers, we've been asked by a lot of our members, uh, the CIOs at the universities and um, presidents to offer additional services, and we can do that with a carrier partnership. So uh, there's a list of some of the services that we're talking about right now with, with the carriers. And um, another key point that, that we feel is, is very important is we want within the carrier to have a product development manager who will be our advocate within the uh, company as we kind of envision these new services and develop them to help us roll them out. They've had the experience of taking these services from experimentation to production, and that's the sort of help that we want to get by leveraging this carrier partnership. And I think that's it. Any questions? Yes. In one of the lessons learned that you were mentioning, um, I understand uh, you said something related with you don't want to wait um, 12 weeks before a service is delivered. Well, did I understand that correctly? Could, could you explain a bit more? I mean, in that case, are you over provisioning the network to be able to cope with all your requests? So how are you are thinking to do that? So? Today, if we go to a carrier and say we want a 10 gigabit wave from New York to Los Angeles, it's not uncommon to, to take 12 weeks for them to provision that optical circuit. Um, what we're looking at some of these technologies, um, some of the equipment vendors, one in particular that we're looking at, um, their equipment uh, you know, offers the waves. Um, how can I explain this? Um, they're up and they're, it's constantly sending a signal where they have a client interface connected to it. So um, when you plug in the client interface, you know ahead of time whether it's going to work, whether it's balanced, and, and whether you can get the end-to-end -end, um, provisioning capability. So we're looking to kind of take that jump from the, the current carrier's model where you place an order and 12 weeks later it gets delivered to you to one in which uh, there's a pool of lambdas available that we can provision from immediately using uh, some of the control plane development that we're doing with Hopi. So did I answer your question? Okay. Yes. I, I have a question, I'm, and, and I'm, I'm from Internet, too, so I'm, I'm not a plant and I'm not going to taunt you. Um, when, when you. When you talk about dynamic provisioning, let's say I, I work with the music education community. Is, is that provisioning from the regional gigapop that you would provision that wavelength? Would it go, come all the way to the user? So if I'm actually at New World Symphony in Miami, I can say from right there on my campus, I want it from here all the way to there. Um, I guess the simple answer is yes, you know, to both. I mean, we, 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 obviously we're dependent upon the, the capabilities of the regional. So uh, a lot of what we're learning is that we need to find ways in which we can work with them to deliver these services. We need to keep the, the service model simple because 
you know, in the U.S., we have 26, 29 different, you know, regionals across the country, and it's, it's very difficult to have them all deliver services at a certain level. So um, ideally, we'd be able to take it all the way to the researchers on the campus. Um, at a minimum, we'd like to be able to do it at least to the regional and then let them work, you know, from there t to deliver it. If they have to pre-provision and have it statically built, but we can dynamically uh, allocate it across the backbone, that's another way to do it. Sure. Okay, I wanted to ask you a question because I got a bit confused with your partnership with carriers versus vendors and so forth. I guess that has to do with uh, your new procurement, like you said, like what we heard uh, a month ago in Washington. Uh, my question has, uh, is what, when you say you partner with a carrier, does that mean that you outsource up to what level of services to him? you outsource your whole hybrid network to them? Do you outsource provisioning and control? Uh, uh, of your of your network to them, up to what level you're using, let's say, the Hopi experience, which is a, a homegrown technology, and impose it into this carrier-provided uh, service. Up to what level are you going to use this carrier-provided service for Gini uh, experiments and virtualization and so forth? That assume that you do have a production network on which you virtualize and so forth. Could you please use the microphone? That's a real good question. Okay. I tried. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that, like I said, that's a good question. Um, what we're looking to do uh, with a carrier is uh, we don't want to get into nuts and bolts. If, if we have a card fail in an amplifier hut in the middle of the desert in Arizona, we don't want to be responsible for getting someone out there, you know, from a and take a card from a pool that we maintain and, and have to pay for. So in this partnership with the carrier that we're, we're talking with, um, they'll maintain the backbone infrastructure to a service level agreement that we've agreed to. And, but they will give us the control of the provisioning across that. So we'll both be able to monitor the, the equipment. Um, they will act if there's a failure and replace it replace the cards and respond in a timely manner, we'll be able to provision across that as we want. Um, so it, it's, it's a very unique uh, agreement. And, and in fact, when we went to the carriers two years ago and asked and said, this is what we want, they kind of laughed at us. Uh, you know, as uh, and give a lot of credit to National Lambda Rail and, and the leverage that they've provided that, that the carriers now are saying, you know, whoa, um, these guys can do it without us if we, you know, aren't a part of it. Uh, so when we went to them about a year ago, they said, okay, that, that's an interesting idea. You know, we'll talk to the sales team and we'll get you a quote. Um, more recently, they're saying, you know what? Um, we have some very large companies with a lot of money starting to ask for that same sort of service. Uh, so they're much more willing to to give us that sort of a uh, control over the infrastructure when a couple of years ago that it never would have happened. So it, did that answer your question? Uh, kind of. Further questions? Well, then let's thank the team from Internet Tool for their presentation. And thank you very much for being here. Uh, don't forget that there is a questionnaire on the Terna website about the presentations. Please fill that one in. And I think we are ready for the coffee break. <laughs>